How are you? Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Sister Kenza, how are you? Alhamdulillah. Sister Rana, Brother Amir. As you can see, I don't have a book. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the Hafta Lillahi. Nahmedahu and Ashtainahu and Ashtainahu and Ashtainahu. When I would be lahim and Shiruri on Fusina woman say yati amalina, the man yati hilah, Salam with the lah, woman the youth then fell a head yala. Was it on that illa hilah, washed the lashi gala, washed the Anna Mohammed and Abdi for Sulu, whom I am a bado, just had a whirlwind weekend. Mashallah, um, we had the Tetleaf newcomers retreat Friday morning, and I volunteered to give the khutbah Friday afternoon. Then we had a three hour Q and A after Juma. Then I had the session with my mother in the evening. Then I had two events on Saturday night. And then I hosted the CIOGC um, fundraising banquet dinner last night. And my wife begged me, she said, oh babe, just cancel class. I said, no, nah, no, nah, I'm gonna go in inshallah and maybe just have a, a light conversation inshallah of sorts for, uh, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes, and then I'll come back home, inshallah. So I knew that you all would show up. So does anybody have anything that they want to talk about? Any questions? Lots happening, lots happening. Anything you're thinking about? And it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to necessarily be a question to me, maybe just a question to the entire group. Um, and, you know, we could, we could discuss it. Anything interesting out of your studies with Sheikh Mohammed? No, we didn't think about that. Um, and uh, the whole verse portion has been tendered. Allah is looking at that. Mashallah. Mashallah. Beneficial, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Patience, man. You know, I, I think that's the, um, the most difficult part of reading in traditional books with teachers is that they tend to prefer a line by line. You know, like when we go to school, the teacher looks at the lesson and then through the lesson plan summarizes the lesson and kind of gives us what's essential and then removes um, what due to their expertise they feel, you know, is you know, not essential or non-essential. Whereas traditionally, people read books, you go line by line. And if you have a, a very uh, knowledgeable teacher like Sheikh Mohammed, he probably stops every line, you know, and makes certain connections and makes certain points. So it could take you, you know, uh, a month of Sundays just to get out of that introduction. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So just be patient and stick with it, inshallah. Other things? Ah, uh, yes. MashaAllah. I want to see those photos, Sister Ken. MashaAllah. I have a question. Inshallah. Yes, Sister Amanda. Um, you, know, you, you can come and join us in the space. It's been too long. Oh, I, w I have another thing on Monday nights at 6. Uh, I'm it. skipping. <laughs> um, the events that you were just talking about, how do we find out uh, uh, more about those kinds of events that we could possibly attend? Well, the Tet Leaf, you know, was uh, the scene of uh, most of those events. Uh, the Tet Leaf, if you go to tetleafcollective.org, Tet yeah. uh, I'm sure you can, you, can, you can find their schedule there. Uh, so I think they do something in the space almost every night. This was all in Chicago. Is it all like, um, what's it called, virtual or is it in real life? Real life. <laughs> it, was real all life. In it was all in Chicago this weekend. Yeah, um, in okay. Chicago and, and, and surrounding suburbs. I think the uh, dinner last night was in Oak Brook Terrace. So, you know, Chicago and nearby Chicago. Alhamdulillah. Okay, and I have another question. It's about fasting. Yes. Um, I decided to actually make up the days that I missed this year. <laughs> and I'm wondering. Sophie, it's good. Good thing. 
unbelievable how many years that I intended to make them up and I never actually did. But uh, I was just wondering if we can do them all in a row, right? Or is yeah. it preferable to just do them they, on Monday? You can do them all in a row. And there's actually a, a statement within our tradition that says, a shita u kinzun. This is what you mean. That wintertime is like a, a, a treasure for people that fast because you get an opportunity to, uh, you know, to all of the benefit of fasting, the spiritual benefits of fasting, and the days are very short. I mean, I mean, we would be breaking our fast around what, 4.30, 4.35, I mean, at this time of year, fasting is skipping lunch. Right? Basically, it's, yeah. yeah it's, it's skipping lunch. So, you know, uh, this would be a great time to make up any missed days uh, for previous Ramadan. Plus, if I starve myself now, I'll have a really good appetite for Thanksgiving. And if you starve yourself <laughs> now, you'll have a really good appetite for Thanksgiving. <laughs> the fringe benefits of fasting, mashallah. Excellent. Anybody else with anything? Uh, you know, people have in the past have been to do calendar Yeah, you know, I, <clears throat> this will be I need to get more active um, with social media uh, and just staying in touch with people. Um, you know, the there's a there's a saying that for men the shuhra for who abdu shuhra, whoever desires fame is a servant of fame. For men arad al khumur for who abdu khumur, but whoever desires obscurity is a servant of obscurity. And I think that sometimes it's like it, it's obvious, like the potential indulgence of the nafs and like getting out there and having people see your face and hear your voice and know your name. And, but I don't think we recognize that you can also indulge the nafs by not getting out there. Not, you know, if it's about the work, it's about the work. If it's about teaching, it's about teaching. If it's about trying to connect people with Dean, it's about trying to connect people with Dean. Um, and if I can be used as an instrument to, to you know, facilitate that process, marhaba. It's not about me, but my nafs, and I'm just being, I think my nafs enjoys a certain level of anonymity to be, you know, I've never, you know, I've never done any self-promotion of anything I've ever done in my entire career. I've never said like, I'm over here, I'm over there, come join us here, come join us there. Um, and I'm getting to the, the place that I don't, I don't see that as pious. I don't see that as like, you know, selfless i think that can also be selfish actually that you know um if you are um, sincere and your you know your goal is allah you do what you do what has to be done if that means that i have to be the one in front of a camera if that means i have to make better use of social media if that means i have to you know uh invite people and make my schedule known, that I just really need to get over myself and just do that. So maybe uh, in the coming weeks, inshallah, I'm gonna put something together just to keep people informed about, you know, just what we're doing and what we're up to and uh, anywhere we can, we, can, we can be of service to people, man, you know, but sometimes you gotta get over yourself a bit just to get out there. I think um, being, a, being a child of the hip hop generation, you know, I was raised on hip hop, you know, it's like uh, to be cool is to never engage in self-promotion. At least when I was, to be cool is like, uh, you know, to be cool is to make it look easy. Uh, you know, but this isn't about being cool. This is about worshiping Allah. It's about serving Allah. So, you know, just something we have to think about moving forward. Um, but I will um, just start giving some updates, you know, even, even here, because this is the beginning of the week. If I'm going to be doing something in Chicago, then I'll just reach out to folks and just let them know. Inshallah. Other things? No, um, I, I asked this when, when the class was first started up, um, this idea of uh, the, the Sunni Shia divide. Mm. But I, I asked it because I, I came into a conversation with someone that's exclusively Muslim mm. um, who thought who would give me these narrations of following these episodes like some of them um, saying that for example the Sahaba 
conspired. There was some kind of muamara against yeah. Ali or something like that. Yeah, and I think like like uh, Tiff Austin said before, I'm just like that. Mm-hmm. Like that. But that was strange that you know, istiqamat al sahaba or belief in the uprightness of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ is a kind of is a fundamental um, tenet of, of Sunnism, of being Sunni. So the fact that that was um, a very tumultuous time, it was a very challenging time for the early community, nobody doubts that. Um, you know, uh, if, if we doubt the peril that community experienced after losing the Prophet ﷺ, we doubt what he meant to them. You know, like we are, I mean, we are centuries removed from the Prophet ﷺ, and we still have amongst us people who love the Prophet ﷺ very deeply. Alhamdulillah, I've encountered them. What do you think it was like for people who lived with him, ate with him, walked with him, learned from him, touched him, kissed him, smelled him. So yes, I don't think anyone doubts that the demise or the death of the Prophet ﷺ threw that community into a state of chaos. Where we draw the line is we say there was no intentionally um, a conspiratorial attempt to uh, ostracize or alienate uh, Ali and Fatima. There was no, you know, the fact that that community was uh, uh, in a chaotic state trying to figure out what happens next. I don't think anybody doubts that. I think Sunnis are clear about that. Shi'is are clear about that. Where Sunnis draw a line is we say, no, these were upright people. These were not people that uh, would intentionally uh, fail to implement something the Prophet ﷺ told them. So they spent 23 years following this man. All of them at different points prepared to risk their lives. He gives them a clear order that Ali should be his Khalifa. And they say, let's, let's, just, let's pretend like he didn't say that. No, it's just not, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not, befitting of us to think of the companions of the Prophet in that way. Uh, many of the, our brothers and sisters of the Shia, they have a particular disdain for Sayyidina Omar. Right? Like Sayyidina Omar was you know, particularly invested in uh, um, ousting the family of the Prophet from leadership. And you know, he was particularly invested in uh, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. He was, he was particularly invested in keeping Ahlul Bayt away from uh, leadership. And it's like, I don't, I just, I don't, um, I don't believe that. I don't believe that about, about these people. So the fact that there was uh, a chaotic situation, I don't think anybody doubts that. You know, um, a lot of those narrations, it's not about the veracity or the, the sentence of those narrations, because Sunnis accept the narrations and Shi'is also accept the narrations. It's often the narrative around the narrations with Shi'is saying, no, no, these narrations indicate a plot. These narrations indicate a willful attempt to keep Sayyidina Ali from assuming the khilaf of the Prophet Whereas I think Sunnis would say, no, this was just a byproduct of a chaotic time. This was just the, um, the community grasping uh, you know, at straws you know, as they were drowning, trying to figure out what was next. And it was a very tumultuous time. And um, you know, people fought, uh, people killed each other. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, a paradise lost to use Milton's terms, like we were with the Prophet And then too, you know, the other thing, the, the silver lining, you know, two silver linings in that, in that history. One is it shows you how a great man or woman of Allah can bring people together that would ordinarily not be together. You know, we experience that in our families, like as long as grandma is alive, all of the aunts and uncles are, 
can come together for Eid. And, but when grandma passes, right? Allah Umrah, may Allah extend her years. When grandma passes, they're fighting. Now, they're, now, now all of the fighting starts, right? Because it was like this, this respect for her that was keeping all of this um, potentially uh, dynamic, explosive tension together, right? And you see that as soon as the Prophet ﷺ passes away, you see things begin to just precipitously just fall apart. And that, I mean, and that's just uh, an indication of who and what he was, ﷺ, to that community. Uh, the other thing is that this was a self-assured community. This was a community of people who, after learning from the Prophet ﷺ, it was clear that many different segments of that community felt empowered. I think that's a great thing. You know, like you were not telling, like, think about this. Like the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And right after that, there's multiple claims about leadership. There's different claims about religious authority. There's different claims about religious practice. There's different claims even about, you know, the recitation of the Quran. Salaam alaikum. alaikum. How are you? MashaAllah. Um, there's different claims even about the recitation of the Quran. Right? So it becomes clear like this was not a community of um, uniform followers. This was a community of empowered individuals that were together, right? But they were empowered individuals. And each of them, you learn something from him, alayhi wasam, I learned something from him too. So like, there's a part of me that is really inspired when I read those hadith of Aisha, like she's challenging Abu Hurairah. Like, nah, that's crazy. You know, Abu Hurairah said once, if a person is praying and he's passed, like his sutra, like his direct vision is passed by a woman or a goat that breaks his prayer. And Aisha was like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. She said, Abu Huraira is likening us to goats and claiming the Prophet والسلام, uh, made mention of this. That's, that's ridiculous. You know, right? Somebody came to the, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha and said, is it true that the Prophet ﷺ would wash his hands and then begin wudu? She said, that's nonsense. The Prophet didn't come to put haraj in the deen. That would make people's lives difficult. Water is scarce. This is the desert. He would never use water so irresponsibly. He would wash his hands and then wash his hands for wudu. That's crazy. So my point is like all of these competing um, perspectives, they set this community up um, for conversation. We are a nation of conversation, right? We are not a community of centralized religious authority where we have like a Pope and then he says, this is orthodox doctrine and anybody who disagrees with me is a, a heretic. Now our community is a community of conversation, right? We are a community of competing claims of authority, authenticity. And in the case of the Sahaba, عنهم, جميعاً, after the Prophet والسلام's demise, even leadership. We're a community of competing claims of everything. So the idea that there was some intentional plot to ostracize Ahlul Bayt. No, I think, I think um, of course, I disagree with, I mean, I'm Sunni. So, so alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. You know, of course, I disagree that there was any intentional plot. I just think that disagreement about even who assumed leadership after the Prophet ﷺ is just consistent with disagreement and conversation as it exists among Muslims down to the present day. You know, it's like, if we don't have uniformity now, why would you assume they had uniformity then? If they didn't have uniformity about matters of religious practice, in doctrine, why do you think they would have uniformity about political leadership? It just wasn't a part of their experience. It was a community of disagreement. It was a community of debate. It was a community of 
uh, mutually exclusive competing terms of who's the leader, what's halal, what's haram, and that bled into um, you know, the political configuration of that community. Do I think it, there was some kind of intentional, mean-spirited, evil plot to ostracize Ahl al-Bayt? I don't believe that. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't believe that. And I believe that ultimately, in spite of everything, God protected the Jama'ah because God said he would. God protected the Jama'ah. Yeah, I mean, you know, and even, and even now, um, you, know, um, you know, it's like people ask me about like the nation of Islam. I'm African-American, so people always want to know, what is your perspective on the nation, bro? What, Muslims, what, 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 what do you have to say about the nation? What, what do you think about the 5% nation of God's earth? Man? What, what's your perspective on that? Huh? What do you think about Moorish Americans? You know, what's your perspective on that? And my perspective is that when you look at Islam transhistorically, meaning just kind of the way Islam has spread in different communities, you've always had offshoots. You've always had groups that were quickly formed. You've always had uh, uh, you know, non-Orthodox groups everywhere, right? But somehow this dean has a way of eventually incorporating those people, they get, they get brought into the majority or they just fade away. Right? And I'm saying like, sometimes it takes hundreds of years, but at the end, they remain uh, an extreme numerical minority. It's like, it's just, it's just, it's, it ends up being just a small group of people that are Druze like in Lebanon, you know what I'm saying? But, but the majority, I believe the majority of this community is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the Prophet والسلام, said, and I believe that this will be true of the nation of Islam. That's why I don't, I don't spend any time bashing the nation of Islam. No, in a hundred years, People will look at the history of Islam in America and they'll just see this movement was instrumental in bringing African-Americans into Islam. That will be, I get it, that will be the story. Like this was a early, this was like an early iteration of Islam that attracted African-Americans. And then after 50, 60, 70 years, they just really became Sunni Muslims. I mean, that's usually how the history uh, goes. You know what I'm saying? So I think, um, the majority of this community is protected. The Prophet ﷺ said, The hand of God is protecting the, the majority of this community. The jama'ah, you know. Now, of course, you have the competing view that the jama'ah is wherever the truth is, even if it's one person. Right? But I think this is a, this is a, a, a different kind of interpretation. No, I think I think numbers have have a certain significance. Numbers have a certain significance. Within our community, numbers have a certain significance. And the idea that uh, you know the majority of that community, almost all of that community, gave bayah to Sayyidina Abu Bakr. They were misguided. Sayyidina Ali gave bayah to Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Sayyidina Ali gave bay'ah to Sayyidina Omar. I mean, we, I mean, what do we, you know, all of the family of the Prophet gave bay'ah to Sayyidina Abu Bakr, gave bay'ah, gave pledged their allegiance to Sayyidina Omar. Right? Things begin, you really see the fissures really beginning to uh, become uh, unsalvageable around the time of the earth man. That's when things really begin to get, you know, out of control. But the early community uh, retained a, a great deal of cohesion, man. You know, so, you know, the, the idea that that history would be rehashed as a conspiracy to ostracize the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I don't know, somehow that's, that's just not very compelling. Uh, in, in the following weeks on some of those conversations, I found that, you know, things like the process of the Black Army, 
he may be following the Lamas on the mass grave or whatever. Uh, but then when the Papa would marry him to the Lamas family, and things like that. But I, I don't know if it's I mean, I mean, at this point, I recognize that um, our brothers and sisters of the Shia, they have a full blown um, heritage, a history. It's, um, it, it's something that I suppose will be a part of um, the Muslim community until Yom Al Qiyam. I don't, you know, I don't think Shiism is ever going to go anywhere. You know what I'm saying? So I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any utility. Like I'm not on any uh, missionary crusade to make Shi'i Sunni. I don't, I don't think there's any utility or usefulness in that. But me personally, I, you know, um, you know, it's, it's you know one one of the most interesting um, points. I, you know, this is interesting, man. We're just, we're just having a free, open conversation. I had a lot. I had a lot over the weekend. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't. I could I couldn't put a class together. Sonia, I'm sorry, my sister. I had a lot over the weekend. Mashallah. But um, you know, there. You know, in Islamic law, there are. Um, oh, somebody had a question too. But in Islamic law, we have kawaid, or like maxims, right? Um. Uh, in Islamic law, we have maxims. Maxims, these kawaid, are like broad statements that are universally applicable, right? And they're always, you know, if a person learns the kawaid fiqiyah, right, the maxims of Islamic law, even if he or she never learns a particular madhab, they will have a good understanding of what this whole sharia business is all about. Right. So and, 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 and also too, studying Kawaid, you, you gain an appreciation for the brilliance of our tradition. You know, it's a shame that, you know, Islamic law is depicted as barbaric, um, misogynistic, terroristic. Um, you really some of the finest legal minds that humanity has ever known have worked in the context of Islamic law. So one, one principle that is really interesting to me is la mushahata fit tasmiya. Can you translate that? La mushahata fit tasmiya. Tasmiya. Mushahata is argumentation, right? The principle لا مشاحتة التسمية means there's never any argument over names. When we're talking about something being halal or haram, there's never any argument that comes down to what something is named. It's always about the hakinka. It's about the reality of the thing that we're talking about. You see, it's never, there's never an argument over what you call it. It's an argument over what it is. Yes, sir. So if that's the case, then the loans that we get is all a lie. The loans? Yeah. So I'll just think about this. Mm -hmm. If I'm supposed to pay off all my debt for a long time, mm -hmm. and I get it. Mortgages, student loans, all kinds of stuff. I'm supposed to pay that off to an institution that's not a human being. Mm -hmm. It's a farce. Mm -hmm. But no, see, it's, it's, see this, this whole business about paying your debt before you make Hajj, a lot of people misunderstand that. There's two kinds of debt. There is amateurized debt, which is like it's being paid according to a certain schedule, and there's delinquent debt. Delinquent debt must be paid before one makes Hajj. So if I owe you money and the payment date we set was November 16th, 15th, 15th, 2021. November 16th, that debt is now delinquent. You see what I'm saying? I have to pay that before I make hush. But if I have a student loan that I'm managing, right, according to what we've, what we've agreed to, 
right? Or I have some kind of, let's, like, let's deal with a real human being because I want to answer your real question. But let's deal with a real human being. I have some loan to them that, uh, some debt to them that I'm managing according to what we've agreed upon. If you say, you pay me $100 every month for the next 20 years, and I'm paying $100 every month. I have a debt, but it's not delinquent. I'm doing what I'm, I can make hajj. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. If I have back payment, like I get behind on that loan a few months, I got to catch up before I make hajj. You, you see what I'm saying? It's not that I have to pay the whole loan off in full before I make hajj. If that were the case, anybody with medical bills, anybody with a mortgage, anybody with student loans could never make hajj. Right? I mean, unfortunately, our whole society is based on debt. None of us could make hajj. If we have mortgages, we could make hajj. Right? But it's, are my debts delinquent or are they being paid according to that amortization schedule? Right? If they're being paid according to schedule, then I mean, I have a debt, but it's, it's being managed responsibly. Right? To the other point of your question, you know, money in our time just doesn't have an analogy in our sacred law. This is money because it's still uh, you know, a medium of exchange. But in terms of it having real value, it's all, this is all fake. You know, this is all, I mean, this is all, I mean, you know, it's almost like when you accept a dollar and you realize the only value this has is my willingness to accept it. it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have any value besides that, right? And, you know, we have, you know, a Federal Reserve Bank, that's a private financial institution that controls interest rates and, you know, can, you know, you know, add value, take away value from currency. I mean, it's, this is, you know, all financial dealings in the modern world, this is like uh, the wild, wild west. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, I mean, trying to be a Muslim of conscience in this space, I think is its own reward. I really feel like that. The fact that we're try I'm trying to just, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to be mindful of my responsibility to Allah. And I don't, none of this makes sense to me. I'm, as someone that has spent years studying the Sharia, no, when it comes to finance, none of this makes sense to me. So, you know, I, when people ask me my opinion about financial matters, I just say, you know, try to, be responsible, try not to jeopardize your family, try not to jeopardize your dignity, right? To be makur, to be overcome with debt is something that jeopardizes one's dignity. Try not to jeopardize your dignity. Uh, you know, try not to, uh, you know, uh, jeopardize your freedom, you know, pay your taxes, you know, try not to, to uh, to damage your reputation. You know what I'm saying? If, you, if your credit is bad and things like that, you know what I'm saying? Try not to damage your reputation, but in terms of real hard rules, regulations, guidelines with regard to finance, man, I don't know, man. I don't know. I mean, like I just try to wrap my mind around what it means to live completely above your means. Like what that means, man. It's like, I was thinking about like life insurance and the pros, the cons. And I'm thinking, if I died today, do I have enough money in my savings account for my wife to even pay off our home? Like if I died today, my wife and my children might be forced to relocate. Like they could not just stay where they were. That's crazy, huh? That's like, no man should feel comfortable with that. But this is, this is regarded as like a regular American expectation. I mean, you know, that's, that's crazy. Like my family could be displaced if I died. I mean, if something like that is normal, then life insurance is definitely normal. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, we, I mean this is just, this is, I mean, this is, I mean, we're in a, I mean, we're in a, we're, we're in a strange place, but the principle, la mushahata fit tasmiyya, there's never any argument about what you call something. All of the arguments pertain to what the thing is. So if you want to like put a wrench 
Like you're talking to people who hate molded, right? Who hate molded, right? You can use this principle of la mushahata fit me. And I've done this. I said, okay, if me and some friends wanted to get together and we wanted to drink tea and we wanted to sing a nasheed about the Prophet Muhammad, and one of us wanted to get up and say a few words about the Prophet. Where's the hurma in that? What, what part of what I just mentioned was haram? What did I say? What, what did I say that was haram? I said people were going to get together in an appropriate way. They were going to drink tea together. They were going to recite poetry about the Prophet Muhammad And one of them was going to give a talk about the Prophet Where's the hurma in that? What, what, what part of that is haram? What? But if you call it a mode, it, then all of a sudden it does become haram. It doesn't become haram just because you call it a mode. Either there's something there that is actually haram or there isn't. But it doesn't become haram just by virtue of being called a mode. That's what la mushahata fit tasmiyah means, right? Similarly, when it comes to Sunni Shi'i debates, I apply the same principle. La mushahata fit tasmiyah. If you uphold the istiqamah or the uprightness of the companions of the Prophet <clears throat> And this is your aqidah, and this is where you draw in terms of your, 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 your sharia, your fiqh, comes from here. I don't care what you call yourself. I don't care what you, I don't care what you call yourself. I call you a Muslim. I, mean, I, you know I don't care what you call yourself, right? So I, I think the other thing that we have to remember when we're talking about like, you know, uh, disagreements with, with Shi'is, is not getting into name calling, but what are the real sources of disagreement, right? If I believe in the uprightness of the companions of the Prophet and you don't believe in the uprightness of all of the companions of the Prophet well, that's a, that's a substantive difference. That's a substantive difference. But the fact that you say you're Sunni and, and I say I'm Shi'i or vice versa, I mean, I'm, more, I'm much more interested in what do we actually disagree about? We know that you call yourself something different than I call myself. What is, it, what is it, what is the real source of our disagreement, right? Let we, let's let Mushahata fit this, let's not argue over names, right? Let's not argue over names. You call yourself this and he call him, he call him. I don't care, <laughs> I'm a person of Sharia, I don't care. What's the, what's the real source of the disagreement, right? Do you believe that, I don't know, I mean, you know, and I, I think that those are the conversations that I see um, um, able to produce some, some, some benefit, right? Not conversations about name calling or even conversations about historical events, but talking more principally about what do those historical events indicate? So if you're saying that there was a mu'amara, there was a conspiracy to keep Ali out of his rightful position as the Khalifa of the Prophet what you're really saying is that you believe that some of the Sahaba were um, uh, grossly disobedient to Allah and his messenger, and that they would uh, willfully engage in that level of deceit. I don't believe that. And that's the difference between me and you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That, that's the difference. That, there you have it. That's, that's, that's where we disagree. I don't believe that. I don't believe that because I believe in their probity or istiqamah, their uprightness. And I also believe that God is protecting this community. I mean, I mean and we can disagree about that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, you know, but the finance piece taught it. I mean, we're, in, we're, in, we're, in, we're in the wild, wild west, man. The, you know, the harder they fall, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're in the wild, wild west on the finance side. I, you know, I'm trying to figure this. I think every day, like, yo, what, what, what are we doing here, man? You know, I mean, 
six, seven hundred years ago, it would be unthinkable for a Muslim to be okay with being indebted at the level that we're indebted in the society, man. It would be unthinkable that a person could just walk up and down the street saddled with, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars of debt. People would be like, no, oh, this is, I mean, they would, they would make dua to Allah that that could never happen. And, you know, uh, I mean, we brag about things like that. It's, it's amazing. We brag about, you know, in this home that I, I just, you know, bought, um, you know, for which now I owe somebody $850,000. I'm walking down the street like, this is great. <laughs> this is great. But I, you know, I owe, uh, you know, Chase Bay $800,000. This is fantastic, man. You know, we're, you know uh, I, I think a, a conversation between that person and a person 700 years ago would be like, what, you're happy? You owe somebody $800,000 and you're happy? You're a slave. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, you're not free, you know, but I mean, we're in, a, we're in a strange, we're in a strange, I mean, this is the debt economy. I mean, people sell debt. I mean, this is the debt economy, right? So if you're looking for a parallel or an analog in our tradition, you're just not going to find it because they, they don't treat debt the same way that we treat debt. For us, debt is very normal. It's not, I mean, just, it's probably, it's probably not a single person in here that doesn't have some debt. <laughs> I'm not gonna ask anybody to, to, to disclose, but you know, it's not, if I said, who in here is completely debt free? <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, um, so I mean, it's, it's, so it's kind of like, you know, what can you, you know, what can you do? Yeah, what can you do, right? Do you know people that do the real basic college? Uh, yeah, I mean, if if you if if you want to to rough that if you want to rough that thing out, if you want to rough that thing out, you got to travel to another country and then make your way to the Haram from like you know Jordan, you know, just take a bus, you know, take a bus, uh, you know, make sure your visa and everything is straight, and just you know, and rough that thing out, and don't. Um, and, and just figure out your lodging and accommodation and everything when you get there with the rest of the, the hijabs, the rest of the pill. You know, it, it's funny how, you know, for us, you know, the four-star hotel, that's just, that's like a mandatory, that's like a rookin of hajj. <laughs> like, you know, sometimes I think we forget that, you know, poor people make hajj too, but it's, it's, a, it's a very different hajj experience. You know, uh, a lot of the accommodation is out, outside of doors. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's just... The, the very basic accommodation that um, Saudi makes for the pilgrims, tents, cots, you know, if you want to make hajj like that, it won't, it won't cost you $10,000 a person, you know, but if you want to fly in to Jeddah and then take the luxury coach bus and then check into the, uh, the, the four-star hotel um, and this is what your meals are like, if you want to eat the food they throw off the back of the truck, you know, they come around to the pilgrims and just, they don't look good. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it'll cost you a lot less money. You know, you know, could cost you a kidney, but you know, <laughs> 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 you know, it, 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 it costs you a lot less money. You know what I'm saying? If you want to make hash like that, it costs you a lot less money. You know, but, um, I mean, subhanAllah, you know, and I, and I don't want to disparage luxury or amenity, you know, they're blessings, but they're not mandatory, you know, they're not mandatory, right? But I think, um, yeah, Sister Kenza had a question about making wulu over leather boots that come above the ankle. Yes, that's totally valid. If you have leather boots that come above your ankles, you can make wudu right over them, but you have to have been in a state of wudu when you put them on, just like uh, like like khufs, right? But you know, one of the things that always like trips me out is some of us think that we're like rugged. You know, we think that we're minimalist. We think that you know we don't really need these first world amenities. You know. And when you really 
get into a situation in which a lot of those comforts and amenities are taken away, you become just a prima donna, man. <laughs> you, just, you, know, I never, you know, I never forget, you know, uh, Hadi and I, my wife, Hafidah Allah, may Allah preserve her, mashallah, uh, traveling to Chad. Now, the trip to our day is that at that point in my career, I was so ambitious that when they asked me if I wanted to do a speaking tour in Chad, I said, uh, man, that's, that's hardship duty. They said, yes, it's, you're going to be in rural Chad too. It's going to be rough. I said, you know, uh, no problem. And I had to deliver eight, you know, uh, eight Arabic lectures. I had to give the lectures in Arabic. I said, no problem. Now, this will, this will be an opportunity for me to really put my Arabic to the test. You know, right? When we landed at that airport in Anjumina, in Chad, oh, baby, I, I wasn't ready, man. I wasn't ready. I said, subhanAllah, this is really an impoverished country. Um, and, you know, o- over the course of that tour, you know, some of the stuff I ate, man, I don't even want to know what it was. You know, and people really were very hospitable, very warm. Uh, they hosted us, but a lot of the amenities like indoor plumbing, running water, uh, they just didn't have those things, man. And um, I just remember leaving uh, Chad and arriving to Brussels. And my wife and I were ashamed at how happy we were. Uh, we landed in Brussels, we were like, <laughs> We were hugging each other like it was Jannah, man. I did laugh. I did laugh. The first, I mean, this, I mean, this was this is shameful. The first thing we did, we checked into our hotel, went out and, and got waffles. We're sitting eating the waffles with the chocolate sauce. I had eaten like this nine days. Oh man. Yeah, bring us another flight. Oh, Allah, oh, like Allah, Allah, Allah. I'm like, man, look at us. We had to tighten our belts and had to do without the amenities we're accustomed to for a week, and we're dying. I said, man, I, I, I'll never say anything. The first world problems, I'll never talk like that again in my life. I don't deserve to talk like that after what I experienced, man. You know, I mean, I saw things in Chad just blew my mind, man. Things that I thought, this can't be happening. This can't be happening. This, this isn't real. You know, one of the hotels that I stayed at, I mean, that thing was crawling with water bugs, roaches this big. We're afraid to sleep. I, I, my wife was holding me so tight. Damn, they reinvigorated my marriage. I say, man, I say, man, I say, wow, you still do love me, or you're just really scared. You know what I'm saying? I say, you know, I say, man, I say, you know, one of the things that was funny, we decided to take a walk around Anjumina, which is the capital city, and we ran into the Moroccan ambassador. And my wife was pregnant with Najashi at the time. And I said facetiously, you know, a lot of people were saying that my wife shouldn't have come on the trip. You know, she could, you know, get malaria. And the Moroccan ambassador looked and said, no, she probably will. <laughs> he said that to with a straight face. You know what I'm saying? I said, you know, a lot of people, I said, you know, we're alhamdulillah. I said, you know, Allah must die. You know, we, you know, Allah is over all things powerful. And, you know, a lot of people were saying, like, my wife shouldn't even, like, come out the hotel room, you know, she could, you know, catch malaria. But, you know, we're not worried. He looked and said, no, she probably will. (laughs) He's like, I said, how many times have you contracted malaria? He said, five, six times. Five, six times. He said, you know, you go, you know, you take take some medication. It's it's tough for about a couple weeks after that. It's not that bad. Oh man, after that I saw I saw her the sibha came out. 
يا حفيد ويا حفيد يا حفيد ويا حفيد ما شاء الله بويز ديفرنت كايند اوف تريب ديفرنت كايند اوف تريب ديفرنت كايند اوف تريب سو يو نو some of that roughing it that we romanticize you know it's a little different when you're really there you know it's a little different you know you turn into christian bale real quick somebody get me to my trailer you know what, I'm <laughs> you know what, I'm what is this you know you you know where's when before you went you know rough this out man you know make a make a fucking the, the hajj of the fakir the hajj of the fuqara rough this out you know what i'm saying <laughs> i'm in the marriott i'll see you <laughs> hey <laughs> but <laughs> love the enthusiasm Tariq. love the enthusiasm i'm going up now to uh, sponge off and, uh, change clothes but uh <laughs> you my man are the real deal said i'm out of you No, but uh, no, but deep sometimes, man. It's deep. You know, you think you're ready. Once that thing, you know, once that thing hits, it hits. You know, other ideas, questions. Yes. Yeah, you know, his, you know, Hisnul Mu'min is the the standard. Um uh a good book. There's some there's a lot of um there's a book called there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in Arabic, but I'm thinking of something in English. I think there's a book that the Mass Society published is called Mathurat. Mathurat. Just du'as just from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Most of it is just a summarization of Imam al-Nawawi's tadhkirah. It's a good, you know, it's a good. You know, I, I think sometimes we don't realize the great benefit that exists in just regular daily remembrance. You know, having a wird, having something that you recite every day. You know, it's not that every time you recite it, is going to be this, uh, the sky is going to open and you're going to uh, ascend into the heavens. But just having that daily, you know, uh, remembrance that connects you is very important. You know, when I was a kid, <clears throat> Catholics would distribute those pamphlets in our daily bread, right? With just little litanies, little prayers that you had to say, you know, every day. It's a good idea. You know, we, we too need our our daily, just daily remembrance. So it's a book called Al-Ma'thurat, translated by, I think, Mass Ikna. They, uh, it's, it's good, it's good, it's translated, simple, it's easy. MashaAllah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the book, but the book, Hisn uh, al Right, the little small book that they give everybody, like when you make Hajj or you go anywhere, that book that just has du'as that, uh, for everything, really. You know, du'as for everything. And what I think really makes the strongest impression on you when you read a book like that is just that they led lives in which spirituality was just an integrated part of their experience. You know, for us as modern Westerns, the spiritual is like a category that we indulge at times, right? And there's certain things we do that just, there's, there's nothing spiritual about it. Like work, or I don't know, you know, right? You don't really see that in, in you know, in fact, you won't find a traditional book in which the word spirituality is even used. It's not a thing like spirituality. Whereas there's an effort to remember God within the mundane, right? Um, you know, the fact that the Prophet would make dua before 
sex before being with his wife and they would make dua together. I think that, I don't think we're really looking at the, the implications of that. Like there was no part of his life that was devoid of spiritual significance. It wasn't like, okay, now we're about to engage the carnal pleasures of the world. God has nothing to do with this. This is just about satisfying a human urge. No, no, no. Even this is something done uh, in full remembrance of God and his bounty and his favor and his goodness. Everything, every part of life, every part of life. Um, for a person like that, spirituality becomes just a very, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a state that we're trying to achieve at all times, as opposed to this thing that we go in of and out of, in, into and out of, excuse me, in of, I'm, I'm really had a long weekend. Then we go into and out of, it's a, it's a, it's a state that we're trying to achieve at all times. And making regular remembrance um, is a part of that, you know? Um, and it helps you to see the significance of things. You know, everything from the food we eat to the conversation that a husband and wife have, you know, in the evening. These are all very special moments. These are, these are blessings. These are, you know, it's like, you know, remembering God at all times reminds us of the great blessing that we're alive, man. You know, subhanAllah, you know, a lot of people didn't wake up this morning. You know, yeah, a lot of people didn't wake up this morning, man. There's no more opportunity for them to remember Allah. Book is closed, it's over. You know, so, you know, in as much as we have an opportunity to remember Allah, I mean, our spirituality grows out of that, you know, uh, recognition. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's a great idea, you know, Sister Ima. You know, some other ideas, questions, concerns. Mashallah, Mashallah. Sister Hiba, how are you? Alhamdulillah, very good. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah. If we don't have anything else, we can close out. But if we do have anything, I don't want to leave anything unanswered. You know, if anybody has anything. And I enjoy the I enjoy the open conversation. Like I enjoy teaching the book. So it's really nice. Yes, sir. Um when Shaytan is speaking Adam and how Adam is speaking to Bismillah. So what the, the tafsir of Ibn Kathir says is that Adam and Eve, or Adam and Hawa, they did not wear clothes, right? They did not wear clothes. Um, and it's, you know, clothes are very, very, very significant part of our experience as people, right? Um, because in addition to protecting us from the elements, Clothes speak to um, a certain shyness, a certain modesty that we have as human beings. Even the fact that as children, we were taught to refer to certain areas of our bodies as private parts. And it's one of the most interesting things about kids is you get to, as you're rearing them, you get to see them develop shyness and modesty. Of course, early on, they don't care anything about being naked. You know, they'll use the bath. And now, if I'm coming to wake my daughter from Fajr and she's already uh, awake, and I'm knocking on the door to open the door, if she's awake, Dad, don't come in. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, man. Right, that, this, and it's interesting to see what has developed that that privacy now is essential, that she would shriek at the idea of me opening that door and her not being appropriately dressed. Dad, no! It's like, I, 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 right? What happened was that we know that Allah Ta'ala gave them the ability, kulu, eat, right? Kula, because there's two of them, eat uh, from whatever you want to, you know, in the garden. Now, the question that 
naturally arises from that is how do they, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Excrement, excrete, is that? How did they excrete their waste, right? How did they excrete their waste? From Ibn Kathir uh, maintains that they excreted their waste through a natural process that was something like perspiration, right? As long as they were eating from what Allah Ta'ala told them to eat from, it was just like, it was through like a natural process like perspiration. When they ate from the tree that Allah Ta'ala commanded them not to eat from, that was their first experience with human waste, right? With, 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 with urine and feces. And when they saw this foul smelling uh, substance that came from these parts of their bodies, they became ashamed of those parts of their bodies. And so they began to cover them. Right. That's, that's the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, of that when they saw like that came from me, that came from that part of my body, then they began to cover those parts of their, of their, of their bodies um, um, out of a, a kind of shame, right? Because they, they made the immediate connection that we're only experiencing this uh, kind of you know, reaction to our food because we ate something Allah told us not to. Right? We ate something Allah told us not to, and now this is happening, right? Um, and so that's, that's, that's the way that, that Ibn Kathir explains that. <clears throat> Which may, you know, it's interesting, they say that, you know, human beings are the only animals that wear clothes. I don't, I don't, I don't, not naturally, right? You know, because we're tool making creatures, right? I'm cold, I, I make, I, 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 I use something to, to protect me from from the, the cold weather or, or the heat uh, and also you know uh, you know clothing becomes an adornment right this is how we uh, accentuate our modesty our beauty you know what I'm saying subhanallah there's a there's a very lively discussion among usulis or scholars that deal with the foundations of religion what are the distinguishing factors that make humans humans some of them say it's the 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 ibham the thumb, right? That human beings have thumbs, which makes our hands prehensile. We can not only grasp because many animals can grasp, but we can perform complex functions with the with the hand because of our thumbs. It's the thumb that gives you the ability to do. Like gorillas don't have thumbs, so you're probably never going to see a gorilla make a watch. You can't be a gorilla horologist, you know, because you have to really have some very fine, you know, you have to, you know, you have to really, you know, you know, horology is something I'm very, I, I love watches and I love horology. So, you know, like to make a, a watch with complications, you have to really, I mean, little bitty parts of tourbillon. You, know, you only can do that if you have a, a thumb. You see what I'm saying? Some people say one of the things, another thing they talk about is laughter. Human beings laugh. There's actually quite a, an interesting and detailed discussion. What is a laugh? Other animals make sounds that are like laughter, but human beings laugh, right? That someone can say something and there's this um, <clears throat> emotive response of laughter. <laughs> what is that? Where, where does that come from? What, what is that? You know what I'm saying? Like, really, I mean, it's even um, some, bi some biologists, uh, just physiologically, what, where does the laugh even come from? How is it, you know, what in the emotions triggers that, that thing that it, something happens and, and, and a laugh comes out? And, 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 and sometimes a laugh is courteous. Sometimes a laugh is really uncontrollable. Like, you cannot hold it. You, you know, th those are the worst ones. It's like that thing is cut, like you could, it, whatever is happening internally, I cannot suppress this laugh. Right? And the more you suppress it, it <laughs> then it really, you know what I'm saying? So, like some people say, uh, the thumb, 
laughter, wearing clothes, all kinds of, you know, what is ironic, they don't say having Iman, because Jinn have Iman, right? Iman is not something that is distinctly human. Like faith is not something distinctly human. The jinn have faith, right? But, um, hmm. yeah, no, it's, it's interesting discussion, right? Interesting discussion. You know, Allah Ta'ala says, wear your beautiful clothes at every place of prayer, right? Right? Um, um, yeah, no, man, mashallah, you know, mashallah. Yeah, mashallah. Hmm. Interesting, interesting stuff. Other things? Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Asr. Inna al-Insana lafi khusr. Illa al-Ladina aminu wa aminu al-Salihati wa tuwasib al-Haqqi wa tuwasib al-Sabr. Subhan Rabbi Rabbi al-Izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-Mursaleen wa alhamdulillah Rabbi al-Alameen. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. آمين. Oh man. So they, they canceled the Tadif class tomorrow. Yeah, they did. You know, I'm the good brothers, good sisters, man. They said, obey, man. You're probably tired, man. Just take a day. Take a day and just relax, man. I said, MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. I was up there on Friday with my mom, man. Gosh, like, that was fun, man. That was fun. Alhamdulillah. It was great. It was great to be there. It was great to be.